It was the fall in a small farming town in Illinois. A family of six was winding down for the night and doing their normal routine for the next day. The kids were getting tucked into bed and the parents were finishing up their chores. There was nothing out of the ordinary, but sadly, they would never see the sun come up. This case has been referred to as the bloodbath in Beeson, and you'll know why soon enough. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kimberlea, and if you've never been here before, it's nice to finally meet you. I actually cannot believe we're into the holiday season. Christmas is right around the corner, and I know that all of you are probably getting things for your loved ones, but don't forget your fur babies, and I have the perfect idea, because today's sponsor is Sundays. And that's my dog's favorite food. My doggies are like my children, my little Dexter and Kingston, my senior boys. And you can't tell they're 12 and 10 years old because they're so full of energy. And part of the reason why they're thriving is because I try so hard to do everything I can to give them both the best quality of life possible, which includes the best diet. And that's where Sundays comes into their daily routine. The new year is coming, which means healthy changes and not just for us, but for for our fur babies too. It's the perfect time to get your pup on a healthy diet. Sundays is fresh, gently air-dried dog food made from a short list of 100% human-grade ingredients, ones that you can recognize and pronounce. And it's co-founded by Dr. Tori Waxman, who's a practicing veterinarian, and it contains 90% meat, 10% veggies, and 0% synthetic nutrients, and that is important. It took three years and over 17 formulations to improve the flavor, texture, and the digestibility before they found found the perfect recipe, and they continue to monitor the quality. Little King Boy doesn't have many teeth left, and he had trouble with so many different dog foods until I found Sundays. Now Kingston can't wait to eat because Sundays is soft, it's easy for him to chew, he used to swallow his food whole, but now I see him chewing it and enjoying it and it makes me so happy, especially because his doctor says he needs to keep weight on his bones. It's better for his heart condition and with Sundays he's eating more and that's a good thing. I can also tell that my dogs love the taste because it smells like real food. You can see how fast both of them run to eat it right away. I also love Sundays because it's easy. I am way too busy for complicated routines. Sundays does not require refrigeration or preparation because of their air drying process. You just pour it and serve it. You can even feed your dogs top quality food even on the go because there's no refrigeration, no preparation, and no cleanup needed. I know that making a change can be a very big decision, and that's exactly why Sundays was nice enough to extend a special discount to all of you to get started. Click the link below in my description box for 50% off your first order of Sundays, and let your dogs test it out for themselves. Give them the gift of healthy food this season, and thank you so very much to Sundays for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get into the case for today. When you hear Illinois, you may quickly think of Chicago. It's a big city, and you probably imagine the hustle and bustle, the streets alive with activity, people rushing to work, tourists exploring the city, and locals enjoying the vibrant atmosphere with the iconic L trains weaving through the cityscape. But chances are you probably haven't heard of Beeson, Illinois. It's a small town about 200 miles away from Chicago, out in the central part of the state. Beeson only has a population of about 200 people very different from the over 2 million people living out in Chicago. It's a completely different experience. Beeson is a rural area surrounded by farmland and rolling hills. It's quiet. It's a slower-paced kind of life. It's probably the smallest town I've talked about on this channel. Look, here it is on the map. That's it. They've got a post office and actually not much else. There's a strong sense of community there, and the town is known for its close-knit neighborhood. People are friendly and welcoming, and there's a strong sense of belonging. Neighbors know each other. It's a family-friendly environment. The town is a safe, family-oriented atmosphere, and residents prioritize raising their children in a wholesome and nurturing environment. The people who live in Beeson tend to be more conservative, which is reflected in the town's politics, their religious beliefs, and their social norms. There's a lot of church-going individuals who seek out living in Beeson because of the strong Christian presence there. Residents are likely to attend church regularly and hold very traditional religious values. It's small-town suburbia, where life is sweet and the worries are few. This image of the picture-perfect America has been instilled in us by countless movies and TV shows. We think of small towns as being exempt 
from the turmoil and the chaos that engulfs the rest of the country. It's as though death and destruction wouldn't dare stain those white picket fences and quaint main streets. Maybe we feel a sense of safety in small towns because we think fewer people live in the town, so it would be more difficult for people to hide their twisted desires. Or the less people, the less likely that a psychopath would be among them. But the reality is that even in the smallest communities with familiar faces, danger can be right beneath the surface. And when that danger finally reveals itself, there will be streams of blood that wash through the once picture-perfect town. And that is the story I'm telling you today. I want to introduce you to two families that called Beeson, Illinois, their home back in the late 90s, Rick G. and Ruth Constant. So the G and the Constant families. Let's start with Rick G. He was known for his strong work ethic and determination. He's a hardworking man who initially worked for his stepfather's construction company in Lincoln, Illinois. That's the town that you would make a trip to if you needed anything. It's about 15 minutes away. That's where the schools are, the Walmart, the restaurants, and their tiny airport. There's more things to do there, but it's not a huge town either, but much bigger than Beeson. There are about 15,000 more residents in Lincoln. That's also where Rick's stepfather, William Kohler, who everyone called Pudge, and his mother Judy lived. Rick's biological father, Raymond, died in Vietnam when Rick was only five years old. Eventually, after picking up contracting work wherever he could and trying hard to save money for his and his daughter Nicole's future, Rick's dedication and perseverance finally paid off. He was able to purchase property at the edge of town in Beeson. And instead of helping out at his stepdad Pudge's company, he opened up his own construction company, G Construction. He bought a ranch-style home with a two-car detached garage and an above-ground pool and lots of farmland where he kept chickens, among other things. I don't know how many rooms were in this house, but at least a few, because in order to pay off his mortgage and bills, Rick decided to offer room for rent to a woman named Ruth Ann Constant and her two young children, three-year-old Justina and one-year-old Dylan. I mentioned Ruth in the beginning, and the Constant family is the other family I wanted to introduce you to. So initially, Ruth became Rick's tenant. But it didn't take long before there was chemistry between the two of them. Ruth was a loving woman who was very outgoing and funny, and friends close to her said she was a jokester. She was really good at making you smile. She loved and cared for people, especially her children. Rick was hardworking and gentle, he was giving and generous, and he was extremely loyal and devoted to his family and helping others. His aunt recalls that Rick was just the type of person who would take in anybody's kids and love them and give them a home. Rick and Ruth were a perfect match, and eventually he asked Ruth out on a date on Valentine's Day. It was a memorable occasion that marked the beginning of their romantic journey together. The date was filled with laughter and heartfelt conversations and a deepening bond between the two of them. Their relationship continued to flourish, and Ruth found out that she was pregnant. The couple then took the next step, and in 1997, they got married. At the time, Rick was 34 and Ruth was 27. Rick's biological daughter, Nicole, was 15, and Ruth's daughter, Justina, was four, and her son, Dylan, was two. Soon, Ruth and Rick's baby boy, Austin, would be born, and they had a full house. As a matter of fact, even though they only had four kids in their blended family, their friends thought of them as the real-life Brady Bunch from the popular TV show back in the 70s, where a couple comes together with three kids of their own, making them a family of eight. The G's were still a big family, and there were more children to come. While Rick worked to provide for his growing family, Ruth stayed home and cared for all the children. And just a year later, Rick and Ruth welcomed a second child, a baby girl, Jessica Lynn G. And they were overjoyed. However, that joy quickly turned to sorrow because they discovered that little Jessica had tragically been born with a very severe neurological condition. It left her with disabilities and she was confined to a wheelchair. This eventually required her to have around-the-clock care and be in a facility that can ensure that her unique needs could be met appropriately. It's very sad, and I just want to point out that this was a very, very hard decision for this family to make, and they did not take it lightly. As you can imagine, it's devastating. So please, let's try to be loving and understanding. 
There wasn't anywhere in Beeson where Jessica could receive the care that she needed, and the G's could not afford it on their own. Therefore, she was relocated 50 miles away in Peoria, Illinois, and temporarily became a ward of the state. Now, Rick and Ruth did their best to overcome their heartache of losing their daughter. Rick continued to work to provide for his family, and Ruth took care of the home, which now had playground equipment out back for the kids to play on, and the family were members of the Park Meadows Baptist Church in Lincoln, where they would gather together every Sunday. Dylan was known by his friends to be popular and very outspoken. On the other hand, Justina was described as a very quiet girl who took pleasure in listening to Bible stories shared by her friends from church. Friends said that despite being more of a homebody, Justina's younger brother, Austin, did love coming to church with her as he got older. The older kids were actually bused into Lincoln for school during the week, and over the years, the younger children would join them. Every morning, they would make the four-minute walk to the tiny little post office in town and wait for the bus. The postmaster, Jody Duncan, she had been in the position since 1999. She watched the G's children grow up, first Rick's daughter, Nicole, and then Ruth's older children, Justina and Dylan, and as the years went on, Austin began coming in as well. Over the years, the children would gather in the post office lobby, and Austin would sit on the floor, finishing his homework, because he said he was more awake in the morning, and it was easier for him to get it done then than after school. She said that these kids were great kids. They never gave her any problems. They were polite and well-behaved. Well, kind of, because Ruth's son, Dylan, began showing some signs of trouble beginning in kindergarten in the year 2000. He had a lot of energy, and that led to him acting out, which isn't that out of the ordinary for a young child. His teachers would frequently have to write reports about his behavior and give them to Rick and Ruth, and together, they would try their hardest to come up with things to work through it. That same year, Rick's daughter Nicole had actually turned 18, and she had been dating a local 21-year-old guy named Christopher Harris. The two of them were getting more serious, and eventually, the couple decided to get married and move in together. They moved just one minute away on the other side of the small town of Beeson, staying very close to friends and family. Not too long after this, Nicole found out that she was pregnant, and she and Chris welcomed the G's first grandchild into the world, Alyssa Harris. Ruth and Rick were excited for the new arrival, and Nicole and Chris would frequently drop little Alyssa off with Ruth during the day while they went to work. Now, Rick's parents, his stepdad Pudge, who I mentioned, and his mom Judy, they also spent a lot of time helping with the kids, and now Nicole and her little family as well. There was a lot happening in both households, especially when it came to Dylan. Things hadn't exactly gotten better over the years. He was still acting out and got even more aggressive. There wasn't much to do in that small town. And it's as though Dylan would get out his energy and aggression in class. And the closer he got to puberty, the worse his behavior became. The only thing that seemed to keep him calm was playing video games in his room by himself, which he started to do for hours when he wasn't in school. Ruth and Rick did their best, but with Ruth being alone a lot and Rick working so hard, it was difficult especially since business was scarce and Rick had to take all kinds of jobs all over to make ends meet. Then Ruth found out she was pregnant again and had a newborn baby in 2006 when Dylan was 11. It was a lot for this family. The G's final baby to complete their family was sweet little Tabitha G. Of course, the older children helped out as much as they could, but it seemed like no one could really control Dylan. And by that time, Ruth had taken him to a physician. Dr. Philip Rossi, who diagnosed him with ADHD and began treating him with medication. This did seem to improve Dylan's behavior slightly, but it didn't stop him from acting out and even going beyond just horse playing at school. He started to play rough with the kids in the neighborhood and immerse himself in violent video games in complete darkness in his room all alone. And by 2007, when he was 12 and his hormones were really going wild, Ruth was desperate. She told the doctor that she was worried if he didn't get the help he needed, his actions could escalate, and Dylan would either seriously hurt himself or someone else. And Rick echoed the same type of statement to his mother, Judy, saying if they didn't get Dylan under control, they would all wake up dead one day. That sounds pretty serious. So at this point, Dr. Rossi decided Dylan should go see a child psychiatrist. 
So Dylan met with a therapist named Olivia Massena for a psychological assessment to get that referral. But Dylan wouldn't stay consistent with coming in for the evaluation period. So the therapist never actually referred him out to anyone. Instead, he continued to take his medication. But that also stopped around the end of 2007. And Dr. Rossi stopped seeing Dylan altogether by 2008. I wish I could say things got better for the G family, but it didn't. In 2009, Rick's construction work really began to decline, leading to financial struggles for his family. This definitely did not help, especially when it came to getting treatment for Dylan and the things that he was dealing with. He became even more isolated. The 14-year-old was spending most of the day alone in his room, avoiding everyone, and still immersing himself in video games. But he had started to get some of his energy out by helping Rick with construction jobs when he wasn't in school. Both 14-year-old Dylan and 11-year-old Austin attended Lincoln Junior High School in Lincoln, where Dylan wrestled for the Trojan wrestling team and was pretty popular with the girls. Even though he sometimes sported dark circles under his eyes from staying up late playing video games, his blue eyes still sparkled, and girls noticed that he was starting to go from a boy to a man. He would ride his bike throughout the town with his brother Austin, who was active in band and chorus, and the two had friends who would join them as they tried to stay active and entertained in their small town. 16-year-old Justina attended Lincoln Community High School, and little three-year-old Tabitha was in the early education program at the local preschool. That summer, Justina and Austin attended an area Bible club. Both children were attentive and polite, and Justina had just become a born-again Christian. And in late July of that year, Nicole and Chris had their second baby, a little boy that I'm going to refer to as Charlie. Chris was working as a cook at the Steak and Shake in Lincoln while studying architecture at Lincoln College. He got all A's and B's and was hoping to get into that industry after he finished his courses. In his free time, he enjoyed taking his family boating on the area rivers and lakes. Nicole was taking care of little Charlie when he wasn't over at Ruth's being cared for by her and Nicole's siblings, and nine-year-old Alyssa was in school during the day. Ruth had even made a few very close friends over the years. One in particular, Natalie Klein, lived right next door. Natalie and her husband had four kids of their own. The couples would get together when they had time to hang out, especially when the kids would go to sleep at night. These people lived a very simple life. However, it was a very active summer for everyone. As it was coming to a close, and the crisp fall air was moving in, replacing the hot, humid weather. The kids were going back to school, and a new year was right around the corner. That September, Rick, his stepdad Pudge, and one of Pudge's grandsons, Adam, were helping out over Nicole's house. They were installing new carpet. They probably needed it with a new baby that would be crawling in no time at all. Sadly, tragedy would strike this family and shake the small town of Beeson to its core. It was after school on September 21st. 10-year-old Seton Landstrom, who was best friends with Dylan and Austin, was racing over to the G's home to show off his brand new bike. Once he got to the front porch, little Seton saw something that made him stop dead in his tracks and not run up to the G's front door. There was blood all over the porch and smears of blood on the door, which was open about a foot. Seton was scared. He didn't know what to do. So he just yelled out, is anyone home? and he didn't get a response. So he hopped on his bike, and he rode as fast as he could to Nicole's house only a few blocks away to get help. His face was as white as a ghost when he got there, and he encountered Pudge and Adam working on the house. As soon as he saw them, he shouted, there's something wrong at Dylan's house. You better get down there. The urgency and fear in this little boy's voice made the men get up and immediately jump into Pudge's pickup truck and race over to the G's house. Adam was the first one to get to the porch, where he too saw the blood, as well as a knife at the bottom of the porch steps. He relayed this information to Pudge, who was still back at the pickup truck, making his way up to the home. Pudge said that the family raised chickens, so maybe they were just butchering some of them. If only that were the case. As Adam carefully stepped past the blood on the porch and proceeded into the house through that open door, it was completely dark inside. He began feeling along the wall for a light switch as he called out Rick's name, followed by Austin's, but he got no answer. Then, when he was finally able to turn the lights on, that is when he caught the first glimpse of the absolute carnage inside that home. 
the light illuminated a scene that would haunt Adam for the rest of his life. Lying in the hallway was the lifeless body of Rick G, face down in a thick pool of blood. Adam was frozen in his tracks. He didn't dare go any further. He turned and ran outside to Pudge and told him, call 911, though he didn't know what to tell the police. As he wasn't inside to see it for himself, it was apparent by Adam's demeanor that it was serious. It was at that moment that Nicole, Rick's eldest daughter, pulled up at the G's house wondering where her grandpa and cousin had gone and why they hadn't come back to the house yet. That's when she encountered Adam, Pudge, and Seton outside the house. She could tell that something was very wrong, and she begged them to tell her if her family was okay. They informed her that something had happened to her father, and the police were on their way. She was shocked and confused, and she begged Pudge to please go inside and make sure Ruth and the children were okay. She explained that her family was in there, including her three-year-old sister, and she wanted to make sure they were okay. Following Nicole's urging, Pudge retraced Adam's steps up the porch and went inside the home on his own. With the lights on, his eyes took in more than Adam's had. There was blood everywhere, not just a huge puddle underneath the body of his stepson, Rick, but spatter was up and down the walls and on the ceiling. It was the stuff of horror movies. It was actually worse. The reality of the scene in front of Pudge was more terrifying and more horrific than anything that could be created for a fictional story because this was his family. Pudge fell to his knees, and Adam took a hold of him and dragged him outside just as the police were pulling up. It had been 12 minutes since Pudge called 911. Logan County Sheriff's Corporal Michael Block and Illinois State Trooper Paul Hennessy made contact with everyone outside before proceeding into the house with their guns drawn. After crossing the threshold of the front door, they were greeted by a large pool of blood, about two to three feet wide, just like Austin and Pudge had witnessed. When they got closer, they could tell that Rick's head was demolished, his body beaten, yet they couldn't tell how he was killed. They assumed that he had been shot in the head with a shotgun due to just how much damage had been done. It was horrifying. They had never seen anything this gruesome, and they hadn't even made their way into the other bedrooms of this house. As they continued down the hallway, they could see damage to the walls of the house as though they had been punched and smashed in. And then they were confronted with a second victim. 14-year-old Dylan, who was only wearing a pair of shorts, was lying lifeless on his right side, frozen in the fetal position right outside the entrance of the home's main bedroom. His wounds were worse than Rick's. He was badly beaten across his entire body, and his head looked like it was in the same condition as Rick's. Again, the officers assumed it had been caused by a shotgun. Blood was sprayed all over the ceilings and the walls, cast off from the horrible devastation that had happened in that home. Where were the other family members? It didn't take long to find out. As the officers entered the main bedroom, there was Ruth, wearing her nightgown, lying on the floor. It was evident that the damage to her skull was very significant. Half of her head had caved in. It was unreal. It's just one after the other, and each one is as bad as the one before or worse. And as they pushed on, they moved into the attached bathroom of that room, and that's where they found little 11-year-old Austin dressed in only a pair of underwear while lying face down on the blood-smeared tile floor in that bathroom. It was obvious that this family was not expecting to be confronted by such evil. It appeared like they had been caught off guard while just getting ready for bed the night before. Bedrooms. They're supposed to be a safe place. But for the G family, they were a place of horror. The officers moved on, trying to clear the entire house, not knowing if the killer was still inside. They walked down that same bloody hallway where Dylan remained, and they walked past him and continued down the hall to 16-year-old Justina's room. For many teenage girls, their room is where they spend time talking to their friends. It's their safe sanctuary. They pick out their next outfit, and in Justina's case, she would read her Bible in there. 
You'd expect to maybe see posters of her favorite band or actor hung up on the wall. But instead, there was more blood. It was smeared and seeping into every surface of the room, including the bed where Justina's lifeless body was found. She was on her bed, lying on her stomach, and what was left of her head was dangling over the side of the mattress above a puddle of brain matter. She seemed to have suffered the most brutal injuries out of anyone in the entire family. And unbelievably, the scene was about to get even worse. If it wasn't already horrific, there were simply no words to describe what came next. The baby. Where was she? As they exited Justina's room, they went into an adjacent room, and at first they couldn't see any more victims. But then they spotted something on the floor of a dark closet. It was a sight of a three-year-old's body crumbled on that floor in a pool of blood with skin above her right ear peeled back that broke these officers' hearts. Yes, they were professionals, but nothing can prepare you to see what those men saw that afternoon in the G's house, especially such a young child just mercilessly beaten until no life was left in her. As they stood there in shock, looking at this whole scene, furniture broken, glass shattered, dense to the walls. They tried to imagine what type of struggle had occurred and who could have wanted this family destroyed. And then out of the corner of his eye, Corporal Michael Block saw something move. He could not believe it. Had he just seen baby Tabitha move? As he watched in shock, he saw it again. Tabitha was trying to lift her tiny arm. Michael shouted to Trooper Paul Hennessy, oh shit, Paul, she moved. And by some miracle, the three-year-old little girl was alive. Paul jumped into action. He quickly holstered his gun and he rushed to the baby's side. He knelt down beside her and he felt her back to make sure she was still breathing. He was going to check for a pulse, but in her condition, he didn't want to check her neck because he was afraid he would injure her. He quickly radioed for paramedics to get on the scene as fast as they could. Paul then turned his attention back to little Tabitha and he asked her, honey, are you okay? Can you hear me? She groaned in response. She truly was alive and responsive. She was clinging to life. Luckily, paramedics had already been notified before Paul's call, and they were waiting right outside to get the message that the house was clear and they could enter the scene. One of the paramedics ran inside, set their bag of equipment down, and they immediately started to assess the scene. Paul let them know, she's alive and you need to get her out of here now. Then the paramedic just scooped her up like a baby in his arms and raced out the door to the ambulance. There was a glimmer of hope in the midst of all of this darkness. They hoped that Tabitha would survive, but the closest hospital with the capacity to save her life was over 50 miles away, an hour drive from Beeson. As the paramedic raced outside, Nicole realized that her baby sister was still alive. She was shocked and devastated by the sight of this tiny, battered body being carried out of the house. Nicole became hysterical. She wanted to run inside and be by her loved ones, not knowing how gruesome the scene was. And of course, officers had to hold her back no matter how loud she screamed that her family was in there and that she wanted to see them. They ushered Nicole into the back of the ambulance, and it sped off towards the nearest hospital. But when they arrived there, they realized that Tabitha's vitals were not looking good. They picked up a nurse to assist them with the transport, and they life flighted her to the Trauma One Hospital, St. Francis Medical Center in Peoria, Illinois. By this time, word had traveled. Little Seton had raced over to a friend's house nearby, the home of Stormy Whitney, a friend of the G family. She was in the kitchen when Seton stormed in, screaming, they're dead, they're dead, they're all dead. And Stormy was thinking that Seton was being just a little bit dramatic, especially for a 10-year-old. And she looked over at him and she told him, chill out, stop watching scary movies. She's like, no one is dead. This is Beeson. Unless they're old, they're not dead. But then she walked outside. And that's when she saw a bunch of lights flashing in the direction of the G's home. At that moment, her phone started blowing up with text messages and calls. What happened? The town had never experienced anything like this, and everyone began gathering on their porches outside, trying to gain insight on what was going on in their usually quiet little rural town. 
Moments later, Nicole's husband, Chris, showed up at the G's, and someone had called him from work and told him that something horrific had happened to his in-laws. Chris left his workplace and headed towards Rick and Ruth's, and upon his arrival, Chris was met by the police, who confirmed the heartbreaking truth of the murders. However, in the midst of the chaos and tragedy, there was hope. The police informed Chris that Tabitha, the three-year-old, had miraculously survived and that she was on her way to the hospital with Nicole. And without a second thought, Chris jumped back in his truck and drove with urgency towards the trauma center where Tabitha was being rushed. This poor family. It's absolutely unbelievable what happened that day. And Beeson is not big enough to have a dedicated police force. Instead, they have to rely on the Logan County PD out in Lincoln. But they don't have to rely on them very often since they don't have crimes like this. At that moment, the two first responders, Logan County Sheriff's Corporal Michael Block and Illinois State Trooper Paul Hennessy, were left with the task of walking through the crime scene looking for clues to what happened inside the walls of the G's home until they could organize a task force. So the officers went back inside and began taking notes and examining the scene for clues. One thing they noted was that a computer had been taken from the home. However, it seemed like that would be extreme overkill for this to have been a mere robbery. And they knew there had to be more to this story. Now the coroner was on the scene ready to transport the bodies. Each one needed to be officially identified and examined. You can't hide this much commotion in such a small town. It's not every day that they see a coroner's vehicle outside one of their neighbor's homes. Since Nicole was the only immediate family member that the police had contact with, they called her informing her they needed someone close to the victims to go down to the coroner's office and make an identification. Nicole was not going to leave her sister's side, so she gave them her grandmother Judy's number. This is Rick's next of kin, and she hadn't been informed of the murders yet. Nicole called her to prepare her for what was to come. When Nicole made that call, she couldn't hold back her emotions. She had to let Judy know that her entire family was dead, with Tabitha in terrible condition. She may not even make it. Through tears and sobbing, Nicole let Judy know the news and told her they needed her to go identify the bodies. When ending that call, she said, Grammy, you're all I've got left now. Drive safe. Wow, how heartbreaking. This poor family, of course, everyone was in total shock. It's hard enough to understand losing one person that you love so dearly, but all of them, all six, an entire family essentially wiped out in one night. It's unfathomable. Judy was given photographs of each victim and she identified them in family photos. Each one, Rick, then Ruth, then Justina, Austin, Dylan, and of course, little Tabitha. I can't even begin to imagine the pain of having to see your loved ones in that condition. It's beyond me how these people are able to keep it together after so much emotional trauma. That night, Dr. John Ralston, forensic pathologist, carried out the autopsies. He photographed every inch of the victim's bodies and categorized their injuries. But in this case, each of the victim's injuries were so numerous they overlapped one another, and it was hard to figure out how many individual injuries they had. One thing was for sure, they were brutal and intense, and they actually were not from a gun. I know that the first responders thought that they had been caused by a shotgun, but they weren't. Each member of the G family had been bludgeoned to death, which is so much worse because they suffered. And with each blow, they got weaker and weaker, and each died from multiple blunt force trauma injuries. That night, the coroner made the call to Logan County Sheriff's Office and spoke to Officer Stephen Nichols regarding the G's injuries. They were all badly beaten with a heavy object. The doctor said, quote, it was impossible to tell where one wound started or ended, end quote. Let's start with 46-year-old Rick G, the father. He had 39 impact wounds, with 13 of those to his head. His wife, 39-year-old Ruth, suffered 28 blows all over her head and body. Her skull was crushed from the force, and her face was indented over her right eye. 
11-year-old Austin's skull was caved in on both sides, and it was determined that he was struck at least 21 times. But there were also signs that he was forced into a hard object, like a counter or a bathtub, and that someone had stomped on his face. 14-year-old Dylan had over 100 wounds to his body, and he had been struck at least 52 times around his head and upper body. 16-year-old Justina had at least 15 identifiable injuries, and as I had to explain, she was missing the entire top portion of her skull. The absolute brutality was undeniable. These people had been struck again and again. And the doctor stated that this repeated blunt force trauma completely crumbled their skulls like eggshells. It also looked as though both Dylan and his mother's body had been moved to different locations than the ones where they were killed. There were gouges on the walls and on a door, as if they had been struck by someone in those areas, but then the bodies were moved to a different location. It made sense that they placed them further back into the house. That night, the town was buzzing with rumors about who killed them and how. Before the G family murders, Beeson was the kind of community where people never locked their doors. Neighbors would borrow things from each other without even asking. But on the 21st of September, all of that changed. In one short night, the veil of safety that had once covered this tiny town was shattered, and residents had to face the fact that someone in their community could be hiding a horrible secret. Residents began locking their doors at night, and they warned each other not to go outside in the dark. It's likely they started to look at their neighbors differently. After all, who knows what secrets that they might be hiding. Marjorie Wright, another family friend and neighbor, was in disbelief when she heard the news. She said she just kept repeating, no, it can't be that they're all gone. She couldn't get it into her, her brain that this horror was even possible. And remember Ruth's friend, Natalie Klein, the neighbor who had four kids of her own? She couldn't understand why or who would do this. She couldn't comprehend it at all. She just cried and cried when she got the news. She said she just lost it. When Rick's mother, Judy, thought about what could have happened to her son and his family, one thing stuck out. The conversation she had with Rick about Dylan. Remember Rick and Ruth had both been concerned for Dylan? Rick told Judy if they didn't get Dylan under control, they would all wake up dead one day. Had this come to fruition? Had there been a brutal massacre of the G family by one of their own? People were wondering. Well, we know that Dylan had just as many, if not more, wounds to his own body. And the positioning of the bodies made it clear that this was not a murder and then someone taking their own life. Dylan could not have caused his own wounds, and there was no weapon left behind that matched the injuries. Rumors were already swirling, though. There were assumptions being made. It was the biggest mystery this town had ever had. The town was worried since no arrests had been made after hours of searching around the G family home. A man named Dale Day, who lived a few blocks down from the G's, decided to arm himself. He said that the killer was still on the loose, and now he had his 9mm loaded, cocked, and ready to fire if someone were to break into his house. And residents who had never locked their doors before were considering it, not only just at night, but during the day. 14-year-old Brittany Fillmore, who knew both Dylan and Justina from high school, said, quote, Not many people lock their doors here. Something like this isn't what you would expect, especially happening in a small town where everyone knows each other. End quote. 76-year-old Betty Poston felt the same way. She lived in Beeson since she was six years old and said that everyone got along and neighbors helped neighbors. But now, no one felt safe. That night, Carol Combs, Rick G's aunt, had to find out about his murder through Facebook. Late Monday night, she logged on and she saw a friend had posted something back at 8.30 p.m., just four hours after the bodies had been found, but before Rick and his family had officially been identified. Nothing had been announced by the police yet, but as soon as Carol saw that post, she raced over to Judy and Pudge's house to comfort them. That's a terrible way to find out this news, but maybe the people who did know were in such a state of shock. They couldn't be calling everyone having to repeat this horrific truth over and over again. By Tuesday morning, September 22nd, a day after the murders, the news media descended upon Beeson amplifying the collective anxiety and apprehension. Journalists and reporters swarmed this town. 
They were hungry for any information they could get on these heinous crimes. There were images and information about the victims and the grieving loved ones who were relentless in trying to search for clues. This was saturating the airwaves and the newspaper headlines. One article headline read, quote, Inside the home's walls, six people were bludgeoned at least 158 times, end quote. As the investigation unfolded, the community held its breath. They were desperate for answers and a resolution to this mystery. The fear was heavy in the air. It cast a dark shadow over the once peaceful town. Neighbors were eyeing each other, wondering if the killer could be someone they knew for years. Trust and security once taken for granted were now shattered. Investigators knew they had to solve this case and fast before this entire community imploded with fear. But where could they even begin? Ruth was a stay-at-home mom, and Rick was a construction worker. They were simple people who stuck to themselves. The investigators did not have much to work with, but they started to ask neighbors if they had heard or saw anything unusual on the night the G family was murdered. A man named Tom Ronlow, who lives across the street from the G home, said he didn't hear a thing. Apparently, he had slept right through the brutal massacre, just yards away. Tom said he lived there for over 33 years and never locked his door before this, but now he is, even during the day. He told the authorities he considered the G's good people. They kept to themselves, and he never really got to know them very well, but the yard was always kept neat, and they were quiet. But then Natalie Klein came forward, and she provided a lot of information that really helped piece together a timeline for the police. So far, the kids had been seen at church on Sunday, but they had not made it to school on Monday morning. The family was found after 4 p.m. that day. Well, Natalie said that she knew what the G's were doing on Sunday night, and that's because she was talking to both Ruth and Rick all night through Messenger on their computers. Natalie was partially deaf, and she relied on being in person to read lips and sign language, so it was much easier for her to communicate over text and messenger than to talk to someone on the phone. So she would regularly send messages back and forth to the G's. Nothing was different about the night. She said she began chatting with them on messenger around 10 p.m. until the early morning hours when the messages just stopped. Realizing the significance of this finding, the detectives immediately understood that they needed to question Natalie and fast. And Natalie cooperated with the detectives and provided her statement. She explained... Justina, Austin, and Tabitha were in bed when she began chatting with Ruth. She and Rick would take turns responding to Natalie. They were making plans for Natalie to come over and smoke some pot with them. Natalie was just waiting for her four kids to go to bed. But she was having a little more trouble that night because her husband, who was usually in town to help out, wasn't there. She recalls Rick telling her that Dylan was still awake playing video games in his room. Here were some of those messages. Quote, Got three down and one to go, end quote. Natalie wrote in a message to Ruth that was answered by Rick at 10.21 p.m. Quote, won't be long here now, end quote. Rick responded, but a couple hours went by and Natalie hadn't heard back. So she messaged saying, quote, damn, I'm starving, lol, and there's nothing to eat in this house, end quote. Five minutes later, she got a response from Rick saying, quote, hmm, that sucks when that happens, end quote. Natalie said, that was the last time she ever heard from the G's. She did respond saying, quote, yes, it does, end quote. And that was at 1.04 a.m., but it got no response. It wasn't like them to make plans with her and then just ghost her like that. So she pinged them once again, explaining that if she didn't stop smoking marijuana, she would, quote, end up eating some weird foods in weird combinations, end quote. Still no response back. At 1.45 a.m., she ironically typed, quote, you still alive over there? End quote. Sadly, they probably weren't. The timeline provided by these messages were very important. Now investigators could ask people who live nearby if they saw anything or anyone between around midnight and 2 a.m. But after questioning, none of the neighbors could give the investigators information on what the killer may have looked like. They hadn't seen anyone in that area that night. But one of them did say he remembered something. He said that around midnight, he was smoking a cigarette on his porch, and all of a sudden, his attention went to an unfamiliar truck that was passing by. He heard the sound of the vehicle barreling down the road, and because of the time of night, it piqued his interest. 
It was heading toward the G family home at that point. He looked out of his window and saw what appeared to be a silver or gray pickup truck, and it had very unusual exhaust pipes. He expected the car to keep going and leave town past the G's house, but he noticed it didn't travel out of town at all, but he couldn't tell where it went. But he did say that there were very unusual exhaust pipes protruding from the rear of the vehicle. They came up through the bed of the truck, directly behind the cab. The truck was described as a Chevrolet S10 or Ford Ranger type vehicle with gray primer and chrome exhaust pipes coming out of the bed. They emphasized that the color of the truck was not a factory paint job. Police acted on this seemingly tiny breadcrumb immediately. They decided to pull over any vehicle that matched this description. This was only a town of about 200 residents, so how many silver or gray trucks could there really be? But it turned out plenty, and this effort did not provide any new leads. So what they did is they had a sketch artist come in and draw kind of a composite drawing based on this man's description. Here's the drawing. This was released to the public. Now, following the release of this drawing, so many leads began pouring in as far as Washington, D.C., and the detectives pursued each lead, hoping to uncover vital information. But despite all their efforts, none of these tips panned out. And I haven't given you an update on three-year-old little Tabitha, so let me tell you what transpired over at the hospital out in Peoria. Little Tabitha, still wearing her blood-soaked t-shirt with the words smile on it, was laying in a hospital bed with a gaping hole in the front of her forehead and a large gash around her ear. These were massive injuries, and the doctors feared she could have brain damage, especially since she hadn't spoken to anyone yet. But this poor little girl, she was terrified. She had somehow survived hours upon hours by herself in a dark closet clinging to life. They weren't sure if she wasn't speaking because she had a brain injury or if she just wasn't ready yet. She was immediately taken into surgery where doctors had to cut into her skull and remove an entire section and then replace it later so that they could allow her brain to swell without causing more damage internally. She also had a broken arm, which most likely happened because she tried to block the blows from this killer, raising her little arm. How sad is that? Nicole and Chris stayed by this little girl's bedside the entire time. They were shaken and devastated. Cops were also standing guard in front of Tabitha's room to protect her. They made sure to screen each and every person that came and went. She truly was their only surviving witness, and it wasn't even clear if she was going to make it. Everyone was wondering if she was going to retain any memory of such a traumatic event. This is unreal. I cannot believe that she was lying there, they said, for 14 hours or more, and she somehow survived. But now let's quickly go back to the investigation. Police couldn't do much with the information about this pickup truck, so they filed the information away, and they got to work gathering evidence at the scene. Thankfully for investigators, the crime scene was a treasure trove of forensic information. It won't come as a surprise that it's pretty difficult to bludgeon six people, five having died, without leaving any forensic evidence behind. When crime scene investigators arrived, they pulled up to a home with neatly cut grass. It was well-maintained. It had a white minivan still parked outside, a couple of bikes leaning against the detached garage, and an RV right next to it. There were toys scattered outside in the driveway. It looked like every other house on the block from the outside. But when they got inside, it was a different story. It would be impossible for me to explain just how horrifying the scene was. When I tell you there was blood on every wall trailing through the entire house, just imagine five people, essentially six, bleeding out and how much blood loss that would be. It was a river of blood. They called it a blood bath. With how many blows each person sustained, there were streams and sprays of blood across the furniture, the ceilings, everything. As they continued to comb the scene, they saw a bloody handprint located on the countertop in the bathroom where little Austin's body was found. Technicians were incredibly careful to preserve that particular piece of evidence, and it was entered into the database in hopes of a perfect match. Now, I learned something. I am still in school for death investigation. I know I haven't talked about it in a while, but there are two types of surfaces, porous and non-porous. So a porous surface would be a piece of paper, let's say, 
And it's actually easier for people to lift a print or get a match on something like a porous surface like paper or maybe even a cloth. But something like glass or a bathtub or you know something porcelain that doesn't absorb the blood, it's actually much harder to pull a print from those type of surfaces. I just thought I would mention it. I like to just do a little teachable moment in some of these videos. But they were hoping that they would get a match here. And then outside the residence, the investigators encountered another piece of evidence. In the dirt near the home, they discovered a very distinctive and clear shoe print impression. It appeared to match a K-Swiss tennis shoe. And despite these promising leads, the police faced a very frustrating dilemma. They didn't have any suspects, so they couldn't compare a handprint or a shoe impression. Although the detectives had no possible suspects, they refused to let that deter them, and they began diving into the theories to try to uncover the truth. Given the crime's violence, they were assuming this perpetrator must have also sustained injuries during this act. In an effort to gather leads, the detectives decided to reach out to the public. They told them to be on the lookout for anyone with unexplained wounds on their body, especially to their head, their upper body. And these could include cuts, bruises, lacerations, contusions, abrasions, even loss of hair from it being pulled out during the struggle. They went with this theory because there was a lot of blood outside of the house, except all the bodies were found inside the house. It also still had to be tested, but the police left no stone unturned. They went and meticulously checked every hospital within a 200-mile radius. They were hoping that someone there would have been admitted with a lot of injuries and they could connect them to the crime. But even with all of their efforts. They didn't find any concrete leads. While this investigation was going on, Nicole was left to face her world-shattering grief. Picking up the pieces does not adequately describe how immense this was for her and what a long journey she had ahead of her. Nicole was the only family member left unharmed, but of course she didn't live in the household. But she knew her family better than anyone else, so the investigators were very eager to talk to her. When Tabitha was finally stable following her surgery and resting comfortably, it was time for Nicole to speak with authorities. Even though Nicole had an alibi for the night of the murder she was working, they still had to do their due diligence and thoroughly question her. They do this with anyone that's close to the victims. Of course, it was hard for Nicole to compose herself. She clung onto Chris, just sobbing in utter disbelief, but she knew she had to provide as much information as she could, so she pulled it together. She talked to them about everything from who her family was, who her family's friends were, who was close to them, and she couldn't think of anyone who would have a reason to harm them. Nicole had recently finished her associate degree at Lincoln College in the spring, and she was the mother to her and Chris's eight-week-old son and their nine-year-old daughter. So now they do turn their attention to Chris Harris. He had been in Nicole and the G's life since Nicole was 15, so he could provide a lot of information about the family dynamic as well. They dated as teenagers, and then they got married. But of course, it wasn't all rainbows and butterflies. As it turned out, Chris and Nicole actually officially got divorced three years before this in 2006. However, they had been back and forth at least a dozen times, and when Nicole got pregnant the year before, Chris started coming around more and more. They were back together, and they were trying to make it work again. He had actually been living out in Armington with his 22-year-old brother named Jason Harris and his girlfriend Jennifer Ernest and their young children. This was about 20 miles away, and he had been living there ever since the official breakup in 2006. And then the investigators asked him the same questions, where was he on the night of the murders, and he told them he and his brother Jason were at a bar on Sunday night at midnight in the small town of Lawndale, which is about 20 minutes from Beeson. They confirmed this with Jason, and they didn't actually think Nicole or Chris had anything to do with the murders, but they had to check everyone. Besides, neither one of them had any marks on their bodies, no wounds, so they were not suspects. And 48 hours after the G family was found bludgeoned to death, the investigators were no closer to solving this crime. It's September 23rd. Little Tabitha is stable with her grandma Judy, Nicole, and Chris by her side. They don't know how long it's going to be until Tabitha would be able to talk to investigators. There's always an officer by her side, watching, listening to all the visitors' conversations, 
and keeping an eye out. The family was slow to lay the G's to rest because they were all spending as much of their time making sure Tabitha was going to be okay. But just over a week after the murders on the 28th of September, Nicole finally said goodbye to her five family members. Hundreds of people gathered to pay their respects, many of them holding on to these white memorial pamphlets with a picture of the family on the front. It read, in loving memory of the G and Constant family. The picture here shows Rick G at the top center, Justina Constant to his top right, Austin G top left in the back next to his dad, Dylan Constant on the bottom left with the bright, shiny blonde hair, and there's Jessica G. The G's daughter I told you about suffered from a brain injury at birth. She is at the bottom center. This picture is old, back when she was still under the G's care. And there is Ruth Constant G with her daughter Tabitha as an infant in the bottom right of the picture. And underneath it says all of their names, organized from the longest to the shortest. It's heartbreaking to think that they're all gone, except for little Tabitha and Jessica. The Family Life Center was filled with even more pictures of the family. They lined both of the walls of the room. A slideshow was playing while family and friends spoke about their loved ones that were gone too soon. Surprisingly, there was an open casket at the front of the room. Rick G was inside. And next to him, there were two tables on either side with two green urns on each of them, which contained the cremated remains of the rest of the victims. Rick was the only one whose upper body and face could be viewed without extreme damage. The rest were too badly harmed. The G family was later buried in Leanna Cemetery in Chestnut. Nicole was supported by her husband, Chris, who had been her rock since the moment of the news of this murder had been given to her. Chris and Nicole visited Tabitha every day. After all, she was Nicole's only surviving sibling aside from Jessica, who was still in a care facility. At this point, more than a dozen law enforcement officers from various police agencies were involved in this investigation, including the FBI. On the 30th of September, two days after the funeral, Nicole and Chris were leaving Tabitha's hospital room when something strange happened. One of the officers who was stationed outside Tabitha's room noticed something a pair of K-Swiss shoes. On the face of it, there's nothing out of the ordinary about this observation because I'm sure many people own this particular brand of tennis shoes. But what was strange about this instance was that not only had police linked the shoe print outside the G's home to that specific brand, but the person wearing this shoe was none other than Christopher Harris, Nicole G's supportive husband. Chris had been Nicole's biggest support since the deaths. He was there during the difficult funeral when she had to say goodbye to her loved ones. He was there. She stood over her baby sister's body as it was hooked up to tubes fighting for her life. He was everything a husband should have been in those moments. But as his sneakers squeaked against the stark white hospital floors, this observant officer felt like he needed to relay this information to investigators. Now, here's the thing. Chris is no stranger to the G family or their residents. His children both play and are cared for over there. He's bound to have left shoe prints outside, but it still piqued the officer's interest, so he reported it. They had already checked Chris out, but just to be safe, they dug deeper into who Chris was and his past, especially any criminal history. They found out that Christopher Harris was convicted of felony theft back in 1999 and had previously been convicted for shoplifting, writing a bad check, and possessing marijuana. But these charges and the conviction was a whole decade before these murders, and that was his last arrest on record, besides um, some traffic tickets. So then they took a look at Chris and Nicole's divorce file. There are only so many reasons to give for why you want to file for divorce. Nicole's was, quote, mental cruelty. However, she made a comment on the divorce application in her own handwriting in the side margin where she wrote some physical cruelty, but she did not go into detail. This isn't much to go on because relationships can get very ugly. We know this. And many times partners will report whatever they can to get their divorce finalized, not saying it's right. Clearly, Nicole felt safe enough to have Chris around and take him back years later and have yet another child with him. Still, they called him into the station to ask him a few questions and get a good look at his case with sneakers. They seized them and compared them to the cement casting they took from the scene, 
And meanwhile, as his truck sat outside, the officers went to take a look. Now, he does drive a pickup truck, which is not too uncommon, and it's also light gray. But it's not just light gray, it's primer color, and that is not as common. And it is similar to the make and model that they're looking for. The thing is, it doesn't have those weird chrome exhaust pipes that are coming out of the back. But the investigators do know they could easily have been sawed off. On the other hand, Chris's shoes were a closer match, but they still weren't exact, and they didn't have blood on them or dirt on them. They were the same brand and the same style as the one from the print at the scene, but there was a discrepancy. They were about a size and a half too big. While they had him there, he willingly provided them with fingerprints, palm prints, and they were sent to the crime lab for analysis. Then they sent Chris on his way. He definitely felt like he was being targeted, and it didn't sit right with him or Nicole. Clearly, he drove that car. He drove all around that town. His car had been parked at Nicole's. Could this neighbor have seen his car in town, his truck, I should say, and just described it? But it wasn't exact anyway. But the town was getting anxious. They wanted answers. And there were so many rumors going around from the murders being a satanic ritual to Rick G committing it somehow himself, maybe that he was beaten in the process by one of his family members, and then he ended up succumbing to his wounds, but not before he killed everyone else. Some people theorized a crazed killer came into the town and they struck the first house they saw because the G's did live in the very first house on the north side of town. But investigators had a hunch it was much more personal. They just had to prove it. Now, the same day on September 30th, 10 days after the murders, an employee from a place called Dixie Travel Plaza out in McLean, her name was Tina Kletz, she was the general manager, and she had some information she thought would be relevant. She said that Chris Harris, Nicole's once ex-husband now back with her, used to be employed by their company, but he had left the job back in June. However, some of the employees recalled that he drove a gray, primered truck. And Tina thought that she should call in and let them know. Tina added that, you know what, the employees were kind of divided on whether it was really Chris's truck since he doesn't have those telltale exhaust pipes. But since it was the only one they knew with that aftermarket gray paint, I'm going to show it to you because I know exactly what kind of paint this is too. And Chris was connected to the G family. They figured better to be safe and call in the tip. Investigators had already looked into this and thought they had been all wrong about even having suspicions about Chris. But they wanted to explore this angle down to every last detail possible. And that meant searching his home and his car. That wasn't a problem. Chris willingly gave the police permission to carry out the search. And it was at his last known residence, his brother Jason Harris's house. They didn't even need a warrant. It was only when the police went to search Chris's truck that they noticed something. In the bed of the pickup truck underneath the tarp, they located the G's missing laptop computer. Not only that, as they walked to the back of Jason's house, they discovered a chrome weight rack used for exercise, you know, lifting weights. It was tucked behind a shed, and they could tell it hadn't been there very long. Interestingly, when they picked it up and put it inside the back of the pickup truck, guess what? It gave off the illusion of chrome exhaust pipes. The math was mathing, but this still wouldn't be enough to prove that Chris murdered anyone. A matching truck, similar shoes, a laptop that he could have borrowed, and a weight rack? But this was more than they had on anyone else. And the investigators knew they needed something solid, something that without a doubt would place Chris at the scene of the crime that night. And they wouldn't have to wait long to get their slam dunk piece of evidence it all goes back to that bloody handprint I talked about. After a careful analysis, it was determined that that handprint found at the crime scene belonged to none other than Christopher Harris. On October 1st, officers made their arrest and charged Chris with five counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. The town, you would think, would be relieved, but they weren't. Instead, they were outraged many of them echoing the same thing. You've got the wrong guy. People just cannot believe that Chris would murder his own family, essentially, and for what? 
The only thing that had been taken from the G's house was supposedly a laptop? Surely there would have been an easier way for Chris to get his hands on something like a laptop without murdering five people and trying to kill a child. He's a father. He's close to this family. Chris could and would not have done this. There was just no way. And one of the people convinced of his innocence was, of course, Nicole. She wasn't having it. She publicly defended Chris at any chance she got. She quickly took to MySpace and wrote a post that read, quote, all of this is such a mess, and it's not right at all. Now not only has my children lost five very close family members, but their daddy is being set up and taken away. This is too much, end quote. Nicole was livid, and she went on to write, quote, There is hard, solid evidence of all six of them fighting for their lives, and Chris had not even the slightest nick on his body anywhere. He has been by our side through all of this in every possible way, and now they took him from us too. He's not a violent person. He couldn't bear to gut a fish for frying. They have the wrong man, end quote. Nicole wasn't the only person in Chris's life to stand up for him and against his arrest. His stepmother, Debbie Harris, told the media that their family believed he was innocent, and his father, Ed, was in tears as they spoke to Chris from jail. Debbie said that Chris was shocked that he had been arrested, and he was fearful for his own family. He said, quote, Dad, I'm scared because I know the killers are out there, end quote. And he swore to his family that he did not do this. Because investigators were made aware of Nicole's MySpace, they were able to locate Chris's profile as well. And they took a look through his post thinking that it may offer some clues to his mindset leading up to the murders. Now, back on March 31st of that year, 2009, Chris posted this, quote, made up with Nicole, we're having a son, exclamation point, exclamation point, end quote. Chris also described himself in his bio as a carpenter by trade, but enrolled at Lincoln College. He wrote back in April that he had gotten a scholarship to attend and that when he finished, he would have, quote, a bachelor's in construction management and a master's in architecture, only five years to go, LOL, end quote. Chris described his other hobbies as hunting, riding ATVs and motorcycles, and in his last post from MySpace on September 18th, just days before the murders, Chris wrote, quote, Chris is happy to be free of negativity, end quote. And on the same day, he posted, quote, free at last, end quote, on his Facebook profile. When Chris was booked, they took pictures of his entire body, and it's true, he didn't have any marks on him. But what he did have was a big blister on the palm of his right hand. And guess what? A tire iron was found out in a grassy area near a creek right next to Jason's house where they were still conducting an investigation. And when they seized Chris's truck on October 2nd, they realized it belonged to a 24-year-old girl named Jennifer Ernest. I've told you about her before. She's Jason's girlfriend and mother of his children. She was interviewed by police and was adamant that Chris was innocent. She and her mom, Sarah Duncan, had already provided alibis for both Chris and and Jason on the night of the murders. But now, when things were unfolding, the investigator realized that information had to be false. So in another shocking move, they arrested Jason, Jennifer, and her mother, Sarah, for obstruction of justice. You may wonder, how did they know that these alibis were false? Well, at first, the simple fact that they knew Chris was at the scene due to his palm print being present and his brother, was last seen with him not too long before the murders at Lawndale Bar. But there was more. A woman named Lori Cole came forward. She worked as an armed security guard by day, but she said she encountered both Chris and his brother at her house in Lawndale at around 11.35 p.m. on Sunday night. That's when she said she got a random knock at her door, and she wasn't expecting anyone. She told investigators, quote, I opened up the door, and I'm like, yeah? She said there was a stranger standing on her porch with short blonde hair, wearing a t-shirt and blue jeans. She said that he told her he came there to party, and when she looked past the man, Lori said she saw the front end of a Ford Ranger pickup truck, and she knew that model because she had one herself. She explained to investigators she told this man, look, I'm an armed security guard, and I have to get up to go to work tomorrow morning. And she went on to explain to the investigators that in this small rural community, at 11.35 at night, you are not going to expect people to be knocking on your door asking you if you want to party. And this guy kept telling Lori he knew her from 
Lawndale Tap House, the bar that he was just at four blocks away. But Lori hadn't been there in 20 years, but he would not leave her alone. She said that he was kind of looking at her and saying, come on, don't you want to do a line of cocaine? But finally she looked at him and in a very serious tone, she's like, sir, I'm an armed security guard. I need to go to bed so that I could get up for work tomorrow. Lori explained that just by the way he was acting, she figured he had already been partying and he didn't want the night to end, but he finally did leave. And investigators know that this area is only a short 15 to 20 minute drive from the G's residence. Another woman ends up coming forward. Her name is Christy Moore, and she told investigators that she and Chris were, um, I guess, like on again, off again lovers. She used to be his girlfriend. And then he called her that night, late on Sunday. But she was too busy with her kids to meet up for what she knew he wanted, which was sex. However, she didn't hesitate to take him up on the offer hours later after her kids went to school. Monday morning, Chris arrived at her house out in Clinton, which is just a 15-minute drive from Beeson, 12 hours after the murders. They slept together, and she said Chris was acting completely normal. After the sex was over, Christy took selfies of them in bed. They were kissing each other, giving each other lovey-dovey eyes, looking into the camera. Chris was even smiling in some of the pictures. This doesn't look like a man who just slaughtered an entire family. And when they asked her if she noticed anything unusual about him, there were no marks on his body, none in the pictures. And she said, no, he was the same as he always has been, except she hadn't seen him the past two months. And I'm sitting here thinking, that's because he just had a baby with Nicole exactly two months ago. So he's probably been busy with that. Right from the moment Chris was accused, he professed his innocence and denied any involvement in this crime. When he's confronted with the fingerprint evidence, he invoked his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, and he got an attorney. At this point, it looked like he would let the law take its course and wait for his day in court, and no one would get any answers until then. What he didn't account for was that while one Harris brother was keeping tight-lipped, the other was starting to feel the mounting pressure. As the investigation progressed, the charges against Jason were upgraded from obstruction of justice to five counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder to match his brother's charges. Now Jason was facing the possibility of spending the rest of his life behind bars, all for something that his brother might have done. Jason had a choice to make. He could either keep his mouth shut and back his brother up, or he could save himself and tell the truth. And thankfully, there's nothing quite like that innate human instinct to protect yourself. Jason began to talk, and the story he told sent shivers down even the most seasoned investigators' backs. According to Jason, the story started right where many bad decisions began, with drugs and alcohol. He and Chris had been out that night. They were partying hard and been drinking and snorting cocaine. At some point, the two brothers decided they needed the company of a lady to really take their fun to the next level. At first, they tried to catch the attention of two women that they knew, some of their ex-girlfriends, but neither one of these women were interested that night, and they turned them down. This is where the night should have ended, but we all know it didn't. The haze of the drugs, coupled with Chris's intense libido, apparently, steered the night into a direction that would end in tragedy. Chris and Jason decided that they would make their way to some other lady's house nearby. We heard from her, Lori, the one that turned them away, the armed security guard. Jason said he waited in the truck and Chris went up to her door. Now here's where things get a little fuzzy because Jason told about 13 different versions of the next series of events. I'm not gonna tell you each and every one, but one thing remained constant. He claimed his brother Chris killed the G family. According to Jason, it was Chris's idea to make their way out to the G's residence and attempt to have sex with Justina, the G's 16-year-old daughter. And let's not forget, he's also Chris's sister-in-law. But apparently, Chris told Jason that he thought Justina had been flirting with him, giving him the eyes like she wanted more. It's unclear at this point whether the brothers had intended for this to be a non-consensual act or whether they genuinely believed in their state of mind that Justina was actually going to have sex with them. But either way, their plan was in motion and the brothers headed over to the G's residence. 
Jason says he doesn't really know what happened inside the house because he stayed in the car the entire time. But Chris walked up to the front door, and in some accounts, Jason said he was already armed with a tire iron, and in other versions of the story, he just went up and knocked on the door without it. In that version, Rick met him at the door, and they talked. But it seemed like the conversation went in a bad direction, and soon, Chris was running back to the truck to grab a tire iron. Then he entered the G's home, and Jason said he heard thumps and screams coming from inside. But in the version where Chris goes inside with the tire iron, it's unclear whether he stormed in or let himself in or someone let him in. But Jason said that after some time, he heard what sounded like a bowling ball hitting the ground, followed by a woman screaming. Then Jason saw a figure burst headfirst out Justina's bedroom window. It was Dylan. Jason said Dylan ran into the driveway and yelled, Bubba, Bubba. That's Jason's nickname. But Jason just sat there frozen in shock and didn't respond. And instead of running away, this 14-year-old boy ran straight back inside where Jason could hear a woman screaming. Then not too long after this, Dylan came back out of the house once again, this time bleeding profusely and running towards the backyard. But Jason saw Chris, with a tire iron in his hand, chasing behind him. Jason said he saw his brother hit Dylan at least five or six times, while Dylan kept screaming, Chris, stop! Chris, stop! Jason made it appear as though all of this was happening because Chris was laser-focused on his single-minded goal of having sex with his teenage sister-in-law and that no 14-year-old boy was going to stand in his way. Jason said Dylan wasn't dead. He was severely injured and bleeding heavily. But however, once again, Dylan chose not to run away. Instead, he went back inside. And we know he didn't survive. After many long and horrific minutes, Chris walked out of that house, jumped into the truck, holding that tire iron and a laptop computer. He was worried that the web camera had captured the event and he didn't want to leave any witnesses. As the brothers drove away from the G home, Chris threw his blood-soaked shoes out the car window along with the tire iron. With Jason's help, they were able to locate those bloody shoes and I told you they already found the murder weapon. Jason said Chris made him burn the rest of his clothing, and then Chris purchased a brand new pair of K-Swiss sneakers, a size and a half bigger, the next day. In exchange for a reduced sentence of 20 years in prison, Jason agreed to testify against Chris. And this trial was wild. It happened in 2013, about three years after the murders, and there was so much that went on, and I am not going to tell you all of it. I'm going to summarize it for you because Chris had a story of his own. He had a defense, self-defense, and it's not much of a stretch. So I'm gonna start there. Tell me what you think. Chris's version of what happened that night starts out very similar to what his brother said. They were partying and drinking at a bar, and then when they leave, they stopped and got some beers, did some cocaine, a lot of it actually, and then called and texted some females that they could meet up with. But unfortunately, none of those women wanted to hang out but before heading back home, Chris wanted to stop and get some marijuana from Rick. You already know that that same night, Rick was planning to smoke with Ruth and the neighbor Natalie, so we can assume he did have marijuana on him. Whether he sold it to other people can't be determined from what I gathered. Nevertheless, Chris said he drove over, he went up to the door, and went inside because he's part of the family. When he opened the door, he saw what he thought was Rick sleeping on the floor of the living room, but as his eyes adjusted, he realized Rick was hurt. He continued down the hall and looked into the primary bedroom, and that's when he saw Ruth dead in a pool of blood. Then Chris made his way to Justina's bedroom, and he saw her on the bed deceased. At that point, he heard something. The floor creaked behind him. So he turned around, and that's when he was confronted with 14-year-old Dylan in a violent rage, raising a knife over his head. And he tried to attack Chris. He had basically walked in on Dylan massacring his entire family. Chris said he had no choice but to step in and stop him. They got into a struggle and Dylan escaped through Justina's window. Recall that there was a knife found on the front porch? Well, Chris says he chased after him, grabbed the tire iron, and began to use it on him until he thought that he had him subdued. Then he went back inside to check on the family. Then Dylan was back inside trying to attack him again. 
at which point Chris was forced to kill the troubled teenager in self-defense. Chris said he was in total shock. He never came forward because he wanted it all to disappear. He never wanted to have to tell his wife what he saw, what he witnessed that night. He then covered up what happened in the hope that no one would ever know the truth about what Dylan had done. He didn't want the family to have a bad reputation in town. Also, the blood outside did belong to Dylan. Investigators initially thought that it was from the perpetrator. That's why they were looking for someone that was hurt. So could Chris be telling the truth? Chris had two defense attorneys, Peter Naylor and Daniel Fultz, who offered evidence to back up Chris's claims. There was testimony from a professor at Iowa State University, and he claimed that Dylan had a long history of antisocial behavior. He had poor performance in school, a below-average IQ, and the defense also pointed out the fact that Dylan was from what they called a broken home since Ruth had left his biological father before she married Rick, and that he never fully adjusted to this new blended family. And he never considered Rick his father. Therefore, he was continuously defiant. Not only that, but he constantly isolated himself and played violent video games, and this could have fueled him to hurt people in real life. He was diagnosed with ADHD, and the defense pointed out that some drugs for ADHD can cause violence, irritability, but the prosecutor, Assistant Attorney General Steve Nate, argued that Dylan hadn't even been on medication for the last two years, but that was used as another argument by the defense that Dylan needed care and that the G's were in poverty. They were unable to provide him with sufficient treatment and counseling. The defense subpoenaed all of Dylan's school disciplinary records for the past three years, and there were approximately 250 incidents in those past three years alone. He was written up for every little thing to much more serious ones, things like throwing rocks, kicking someone in the crotch, even spraying Lysol on a classmate. He also slashed his seats on the bus with a stolen razor blade, and he was heard saying that he couldn't wait until the stupid school blew up. And that was after he didn't do well on a test. The police were actually called. There were other reports of him being physical with a student. He elbowed someone in the face hard enough to give them a bloody nose and break their glasses. So he did have a propensity for becoming aggressive. And when he wasn't in school, he was aggressive toward members of his own family. The defense said they planned to have Chris's young daughter, Alyssa, who was nine at the time that Chris was arrested, but now 14, to testify that she saw Dylan pull a knife on his younger brother, Austin. And on another occasion, Dylan put Austin in a headlock while they were in the swimming pool and forced his head underwater repeatedly, enough that eyewitnesses thought that he was trying to drown the boy. The judge, however, blocked the jury from hearing those statements I told you about that Rick and Ruth made about being afraid that Dylan might kill the whole family if he didn't get help. The statement contained no specific threat, so it was decided it was made too long before the murders and the jury shouldn't hear about it. But it was the DNA evidence in this case that was a big factor. It's truly hard to believe that someone can kill five people, almost six, and not have one scratch on them. If it truly was Dylan, it would make sense that he was so injured considering his family would have been fighting back at some point. And Rick's DNA was actually found under Dylan's fingernails. But the prosecutor's expert witness said that that was reasonable, considering they live in the same household together. However, Chris's DNA wasn't on the scene. I don't know what it would have been like being on that jury, but they were put through a lot. There were pictures of these poor victims, and it was traumatizing. Some jurors had to turn their heads. It was so graphic. A blood spatter expert testified for the prosecution that they said that the killer's legs would have been sprayed with blood because of the location of the victims close to the floor, especially in Justina's case, because she was laying hanging off the side of the bed. There was no blood spatter on Dylan's lower extremities. He was wearing shorts. His legs were bare. The expert said whoever hit Justina would have had blood all over their lower extremities, so it didn't add up. There was only a few small spots of blood on the front of Dylan's legs. And Dylan had sustained so many injuries that it was illogical to believe he would have been able to continue to kill his family. The injuries to all of his knuckles alone would have prevented him from being able to hold a tire iron. And when prosecutors provided evidence and testimony from Dylan's actual teachers, they told a different story about the so-called troubled teen. 
One said he was a joy to have in class. Tamara Pagel, a special education teacher who teared up on the stand, said that Dylan just had a lot of energy. She said, quote, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Jackson, but Dylan was the kind of kid who would do the moonwalk on the way to the pencil sharpener, end quote. Lisa Howard, another teacher, did testify that, of course, Dylan ranked in the top three for disciplinary referrals, but the vast majority of them, according to her, were minor, things like speaking up in class without raising his hand or pushing a notebook from his desk to the floor. And Lisa said, when he became frustrated, all she had to do was have a talk with him. He was described as fun-going and loving and brotherly towards his siblings, especially Tabitha, who was in their early education program. Lisa said that he doted on Tabitha like there was no tomorrow. Dylan's wrestling coach even testified. His name was Alex Dawson. He told the court Dylan didn't have enough fight in him to be a great wrestler, but he had spirit and game, so much so that coaches chose Dylan as the team's most inspirational wrestler in his first season. Alex said, quote, he was new to the sport and he didn't have the aggression that a lot of kids have, end quote. Dylan was described as a good listener and a fast learner, and he was never a problem at wrestling practice. Telephone records showed that Chris Harris borrowed a phone at the Lawndale Bar at 11.18 p.m. the night of the killings. The call lasted about 10 minutes. Then witnesses say Chris and Jason finished their beers. We know they stopped at Lori's house, the armed security guard just a few blocks from the bar. After that, they headed to Beeson. The prosecutors estimate that the brothers would have gotten into Beeson sometime before 12.30 in the morning. The last message from Rick came at 12.42 in the morning. So they argued he would have been alive when the Harris brothers got to that house. And then there was the state's star witness, Jason Harris, who had pleaded guilty to perjury not too long ago. He was a liar through and through, and he admitted that. I told you that he had 13 different versions of what happened that night. The one he finally stuck with at trial was the one I told you about Chris wanting to have sex with Justina and that he took the tire iron with him when he went to the door. There he encountered Rick and there was an altercation because Rick didn't want Chris talking to his teenage daughter. According to Jason, Chris already had that tire iron because he knew he would need it in case Justina fought back. But instead, he used it to kill her entire family in a drug-filled rage. Because in Jason's words, he didn't want to leave any witnesses. Jason admitted to burning the clothes, lying about the alibi, and hiding the laptop. The defense tried to negate all of this by showing a letter that Jason wrote to his brother when he was in jail. That everyone knew that Chris didn't do this. But now he's saying that he did. But it turns out, that Jason wasn't the only one who gave a different perspective on the murders than what Chris was telling the court. A former cellmate of Chris's came forward, and he claimed that Chris had confessed to the entire murder. According to the cellmate, Chris told him the real story of what happened that night, and it was even more brutal than what Jason told them. Chris allegedly told his cellmate that when he arrived at the G home, Rick greeted him at the door, and he and Rick started to argue. That's when he struck Rick with the tire iron. Ruth heard the noise and went to figure out what was going on. When she walked into the room, he turned his vicious attack on her. At this point, Dillard managed to get a hold of a knife from the kitchen and attempted to come between Chris and Ruth. Chris managed to overpower Dylan, which is when Jason saw him crash through the window that first time. According to the cellmate, Chris told him that his only regret was that he didn't burn down that house that night. If he had, they would have never known it was him. Remember how Nicole was standing by Chris's side? Well, she was supposed to appear in court with her daughter Alyssa to testify, but they conveniently missed their flight from Florida where they had moved following the murders. Nicole was supposed to tell the court that she talked to her dad, Rick, only days before the murders and that Rick was scared that Dylan was going to retaliate violently because Rick had punished him for breaking down Rick's bedroom door and stealing money and that he'd stolen drugs and pornography from him as well. And little Alyssa was going to testify that she heard Dylan once say that he would kill his siblings. But this crucial testimony never came. After a month of hearing explicit testimony and graphic evidence from the investigation, it was time for the jury to make their decision. These men and women had to decide between two realities, whether they believed that a 14-year-old boy killed his family and was only stopped by the heroic actions of a drunk and high man, or that a drunk and high man 
who believed his own wants and needs were above the lives of innocent people, had brutalized this family and then denied it and tried to blame it on a child. Ultimately, you probably guessed, Chris was found guilty of over 50 different counts of murder, attempted murder, home invasion, and robbery. 19-year-old Seth Jones was not only a neighbor of the G's, but he was one of the jurors. He said that the physical evidence against Chris was overwhelming. He said, quote, It was tough. I honestly was looking through everything to find something to say that he wasn't guilty, end quote. It was the shoe print, the bloody shoes, the bloody handprints, and Chris's own actions in the days after the murders that resonated with the jurors. Seth also admitted he didn't even find any truth in Jason's testimony. And on July 19, 2013, Chris had his sentencing hearing, and believe it or not, brave little Tabitha, who is now seven years old, gave an impact statement. She said, quote, I am seven, and it still breaks my heart and I wish you were dead, and my brothers and sister and mommy and daddy were alive. You don't sneak up on other people. You have to say sorry, because do you know how badly that broke my heart? End quote. That made me tear up. Can you imagine all that this little girl has been through? And in a powerful victim impact statement, Nicole, who once defended Chris, expressed her deep pain and loss. During her statement, Nicole said, quote, you are nothing to my babies or me, you're never getting out, so give it up. Remember, you had it all. No, you could have had it all. You are a mess up, and that is all you'll ever be, end quote. Rick G's mother stood before the courtroom, her eyes filled with sadness and determination. She held two victim impact statements, each representing a different facet of the tragedy that this family had to endure. As she began to read the first statement, her voice was shaking but her resolve remained unshaken. The first statement was written from the perspective of Tabitha. She talked about how Tabitha had emerged from the darkness to thrive and build a life for herself, that the little girl refused to let the horrors that she had witnessed define her. And then Rick's mom shifted her focus to her son and grandchildren. She spoke of their absence and the deep void in her life. In a final statement, she addressed Chris directly. She said, quote, I pray you're dealt with the amount of mercy you showed my son and family, end quote. This was a plea for justice, a heartfelt plea for the pain afflicted upon her loved ones to be acknowledged and accounted for. On the 19th of July in 2013, Christopher Harris was sentenced to five life sentences, which were to run consecutively, plus 30 years for attempted murder, 20 years for robbery, and 30 years for home invasion. Chris will never be free again. But during his sentencing, Chris spoke up. He said, quote, I made a lot of stupid, stupid decisions that night, but I did not commit this crime, end quote. As for Jason, in return for testifying against his brother, he received a 10-year sentence with credit served. It's hard to say whether this was appropriate for someone who was essentially an accessory to a crime. There were so many moments where Jason could have changed the course of that horrible evening. So many times he could have walked up to Chris and even ended this madness. So many times he could have done something. Dylan called out to Jason, begging him to do something, but he did nothing. On the other hand, he did something. His testimony secured justice for the G family. To wrap it up, Jason's girlfriend, Jennifer, and her mom, they were given probation and fines for their role in concealing evidence. And if you're wondering what happened to little Tabitha, remember those state troopers that were guarding her hospital door? They became her playmates over the two months she was recovering in that hospital. They did things like paint her toenails, read books to her, and play games. They pretty much treated her like their own daughter, even threw her a birthday party. She had to go through a number of surgeries, but miraculously, she made a full recovery. Fortunately, those head injuries actually prevented her from remembering anything from that horrific night when she lost her entire family. She did go into foster care at one point, but... As time went on, she was eventually placed under the supervision of her sister, Nicole. In the aftermath of these murders, this community tried to heal and repair what had been lost. As part of the healing, the community dedicated a place to celebrate the life of the G family. They built a playground in honor of Austin, Dylan, and Justina. I want to end with something interesting that I found out. There was one further twist in the story. In 2014, apparently Investigation Discovery aired a show called When Murder Comes to Town, 
And in this show, they claim to provide viewers with an insight into the murders of the G family. I actually watched this episode. Despite interviewing many of the residents of Beeson and even the officers that were involved in the investigation, the show focused heavily on Dylan and repeated the same story that the defense put forward during a trial. Even the reenactments of Dylan in the show gave viewers the impression that he was deeply troubled, that he was a violent boy who was actually capable of killing his whole family. In response to Dylan's portrayal in this program, officers that were involved in this investigation actually wrote an open letter which questioned the show's integrity and its need to call into question the reputation of a child homicide victim. The letter, which I will link in its entirety below, highlighted that Dylan was acting as a hero. And it said in part, quote, the graphic makeup utilized in the film by the actor portraying Dylan Constant was over the top, giving the appearance that Dylan was anything but a normal teenager. Interviews conducted during the investigation indicated that Dylan was like many teenagers who enjoyed playing video games. Information that would indicate he was violent towards his family or anyone else was never substantiated. As a matter of fact, Dylan did crawl out of a window and could have saved himself. Chris Harris followed Dylan and brutally beat him on the steps and porch outside the house. When Harris re-entered the home, Dylan followed him to help his family. Chris Harris then finally beat Dylan to death. The jury in the trial of Chris Harris rejected the defense's claims of self-defense and convicted Harris. The film was accurate in many ways, but to depict Dylan Constant as anything but a heroic teenage boy trying to save his family is a serious injustice to this youth and a drastic deviation from the facts, end quote. I wanted to end with that because from everything you've heard, it might have very well seemed it was plausible. But in the end, Dylan was trying to save his family. This was a really hard story. It always is when young people lose their lives, when anyone loses their lives. But an entire family like this, it's unbelievable. I thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you for giving these victims your time. I will see you in my next video.